Welcome to the Plume and Page. Today's story is Why the Sea is Salt. Once upon a time, long, long ago, there were two brothers, the one rich and the other poor. When Christmas Eve came, the poor one had not a bite in the house, either of meat or bread, so he went to his brother and begged him, in heaven's name, to give him something for Christmas Day. It was by no means the first time his brother had been forced to give some food to him, and he was no more pleased at being asked now than he generally was. "'If you will do what I ask you, you shall have a whole ham,' said he. The poor one immediately thanked him and promised, "'Well, here is the ham, and now you must go straight to Dead Man's Hall,' said the rich brother, throwing the ham to him. "'Well, I will do what I have promised.' said the poor man, and he took the ham and set off. He went on and on for the live-long day, and at nightfall he came to a place where there was a bright light. I have no doubt this is the place, thought the man with the ham. An old man with a long white beard was chopping yule logs. Good evening, said the man with the ham. Good evening to you. Where are you going at this late hour? asked the old man. I am going to Dead Man's Hall, if only I am on the right track, answered the poor man. Oh, yes, you are right enough, for it is here, the old man said. When you go inside, they will all want to buy your ham, for they don't get much meat to eat there. But you must not sell it unless you can get, for it, the hand mill which stands behind the door. When you come out again, I will teach you how to stop the handmill, which is useful for almost everything. So the man with the ham thanked the other for his good advice and rapped at the door. When he went in, everything happened just as the old man had said. All the people, great and small, came around him like ants on an anthill, and each tried to outbid the other for the ham. By rights, my old woman, and I should have it for our Christmas dinner. "'But since you have set your hearts upon it, I must just give it up to you,' said the man. "'But if I sell it, I will have the handmill standing there behind the door.' At first they would not hear of this, and haggled and bargained with the man, but he stuck to what he had said, and the people were forced to give the handmill to him. When the man returned to the yard, he asked the old woodcutter how to stop the handmill, and when he had learned that, he thanked him and set off with all the speed he could, but did not arrive home until after the clock had struck twelve on Christmas Eve. "'But where in the world have you been?' asked the old woman, his wife. "'Here I have sat waiting for you hour after hour, and have not even two sticks to lay across each other underneath the Christmas porridge pot. Oh, I could not come before. I had something of importance to see about, and a long way to go, too. But now you shall just see,' said the man." Then he set the mill on the table, and bade it first grind light, then a tablecloth, then meat and beer, and everything else that was good for a Christmas Eve supper. And the mill ground all that he ordered. Bless me, said the old woman, as one thing after another appeared. She wanted to know where her husband had gotten the mill, but he would not tell her. Never mind where I got it. You can see it is a good one, and the water that turns it will never freeze said the man. So he ground meat and drink and all kinds of good things to last through Christmas tide. And on the third day he invited friends to come to a feast. Now when the rich brother saw what there was at the banquet and in the house, he was both vexed and angry, for he grudged everything his brother had. On Christmas Eve he was so poor he came to me and begged for a trifle, and here he gives a feast as if he were both a count and a king, thought he. "'But for heaven's sake, tell me where you got your riches,' said he to his brother. "'From behind the door,' said he who owned the mill, "'for he did not choose to satisfy his brother on that point. "'But later in the evening, when he had taken a drop too much, "'he could not refrain from telling how he had come by the hand mill. "'There you see what has brought me all my wealth.' "'And he brought out the mill from the cupboard "'and made it grind first one thing and then another.' When the brother saw that, he insisted on having the mill, and after a great deal of persuasion got it. 
but he had to give three hundred dollars for it, and the poor brother was to keep it till haymaking time, for he thought, if I keep it that long, I can make it grind meat and drink that will last many a long year. During that time the mill did not grow rusty, and when hay harvest came the rich brother took it, but the other had taken good care not to teach him how to stop it. It was evening when the rich man reached home, and in the morning he bade the old woman who tended his rooms and kitchen go out and spread the hay after the mowers, for he would attend to the house himself that day. So, when dinner time drew near, he set the mill on the kitchen table and said, Grind herrings and milk pudding, and do it both quickly and well. So the mill began to grind herrings and milk pudding, and first all the dishes and tubs were filled, and then it covered the kitchen floor. The man twisted and turned the mill and did all he could to make it stop, but howsoever he turned it and screwed it, the mill went on grinding, and in a short time the pudding rose so high that the man was almost drowned, so he threw open the parlor door, but it was not long before the mill had ground the parlor full too. And it was with difficulty and danger that the man got through the mess of pudding and grabbed hold of the door latch. When the door was open, he did not stay long in the room, but ran out, and the herrings and pudding came after him and streamed out over both farm and field. Now the old woman, who was out spreading the hay, began to think dinner was long in coming, and said to the women and the mowers, Though the master does not call us home, we may as well go. It may be he finds he is not good at making dinner, and I should go to help him. So they began to straggle homeward, but a little way up the hill they met the herrings and pudding, all pouring forth and winding about one over the other, and the man himself in front of the flood. Would to heaven that each of you had a hundred stomachs! Take care that you are not drowned in the pudding, he cried as he ran by them, as if mischief were at his heels, down to where his brother dwelled. Then he begged him to take the mill back again, and to do so in that instant, for, said he, if it grind one hour more, the whole district will be destroyed by herrings and pudding. But the brother would not take it, until the other paid him another three hundred dollars, and that he was obliged to do. Now the poor brother had both the money and the mill again, so it was not long before he had a farmhouse much finer than his brother's. But the mill ground him so much money that he covered his house with blocks of gold, and... As it lay close by the seashore, it shone and glittered far out to sea. Every one who sailed by put in to visit the rich man in the gold farmhouse, and every one wanted to see the wonderful mill, for the report of it spread far and wide. And there was no one who had not heard tell of it. After a long, long time there came a skipper who wished to see the mill. He asked if it could make salt. Yes, it can make salt, said he who owned it. And when the skipper heard that, he wished with all his might and main to have the mill no matter what it cost. He thought that if he had it, he would not have to sail far away over the perilous sea for his cargo of salt. At first the owner would not hear of parting with the mill, but the skipper begged and prayed, and at last the man sold it to him for many, many thousands of dollars. When the skipper had the mill, he did not stay long, for he was afraid the man would change his mind, and he had no time to ask how he was to stop it grinding but went on board his ship as fast as he could. When he had gone a little way out to sea, he took the mill on deck. Grind salt and grind both quickly and well, said the skipper. So the mill began to grind salt, till it spouted out like water, and when the skipper had the ship filled, he wanted to stop the mill, but whichsoever way he turned it, and however so he tried, it went on grinding, and the heap of salt grew higher and higher, until at last the ship sank. There lies the mill at the bottom of the sea, and still, day by day, it grinds on, and that is why the sea is salt.